Hi students, I am Dr. Ramya Shree of Gain Educator. So today I am going to discuss the FMG 2020 question paper. So after the question paper, I think every one of you can tell that OBG is a very very important subject because there were plenty of questions from OBG and if you are perfect with your notes pertaining to the OBG, nobody can stop you from getting the 30 to 35 marks. So all those who are future aspirants for the FMG, you should be careful and you should be perfect with your obstacles. Careful and you should because it's a highly scoring subject as well as it's an easy subject, right? So let's see what were the questions which we, which have come. Most of the questions, I think almost all questions were something which we discussed in our class. So let's go through the questions and quick recap what we have learned and what we got as an exam questions. So let's start with the first question. True conjugate is. So the first question uh, I am discussing is the true conjugate is. So there were the options lower border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory, upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. Now probably by the options you might get confused what is the true conjugate. But I have a very simple way of for you to remember the conjugates. So the conjugates are mainly the anteroposterior diameter of the pelvic inlet, right? So the, you have three conjugates, diagonal conjugate, obstic conjugate and true conjugate. How do I remember them are from below upwards dot, from below to upwards it is dot. So first is diagonal conjugate and as you observe, Diagonal conjugate is from the lower border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. Diagonal conjugate is from lower border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. Next we have the obstetric conjugate. Obstetric conjugate is from the posterior surface of the pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. True conjugate is from the upper border of pubic symphysis to the sacral promontory. Right? So sacral promontory is common, pubic symphysis is common but lower border, posterior surface and upper border. How do you remember this? You remember it as dot, diagonal conjugate, obstetric conjugate, true conjugate. True conjugate is also called as anatomical conjugate. True conjugate is also called as anatomical conjugate. Some of the other common MCQs which they can ask you pertaining to the conjugate. See, conjugate is something which can be asked again and again. It's a many times repeat question. So they can ask you, what is the conjugate which is measurable? What we can measure is the diagonal conjugate. Diagonal conjugate is measurable. From diagonal conjugate, when you subtract 1.5 centimeters, you get the obstetric conjugate. So diagonal conjugate is 12 centimeters. Diagonal conjugate minus 1.5 centimeters will give you obstetric conjugate, which is 10.5 centimeters. And you have the true conjugate, which will be 11 centimeters. So this is pertaining to the first question. So let's see the options and choose the best answer now. So true conjugate is dot, so last top. So that is upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory. So I hope this mnemonic will help you to remember it the best and never to get confused. So from below to upwards, it is the dot which is the MCQ. Lower border diagonal, posterior surface obstetric, upper border true conjugate, right? So let's see the second question. A woman with secondary amenorrhea with history of curettage for abortion. FSH is 7 micro international units per ml. What is your diagnosis? This is also a repeat question guys. Now the very important clue here in this question is the FSH level. So you should be knowing what is a normal FSH level. When do you call high FSH? When do you call low FSH? So let's understand first that part. So normal FSH level is... 5 to 20 international units per liter. Less than 5 is considered as low. Now when do you have low FSH levels? When the hypothalamus is not producing GnRH or when the pituitary is not producing FSH and LH, right? So low FSH is an indicator of hypothalamopituitary causes that is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism right 
whereas when fsh level is more than 20 international units per liter it means there is fsh level is going on producing lot and there is no negative feedback no negative feedback means the ovary is not functioning and ovary is not able to produce estrogen as estrogen is not being produced so there is no negative feedback on the pituitary and because of that fsh levels are very much increased so whenever you have fsh more than 20 it is considered high and it is an indication of hypergonadotrophic see gonadotrophins are high but gonad is not functioning so hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism right So the first one, this hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is hypothalamo pituitary failure. Whereas hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is suggestive of ovarian failure. You also have something called as premature ovarian failure. Premature ovarian failure is when FSH level is more than 40 international units per liter done on two occasions, six weeks apart right so when you go back and see in the question the fsh is 7 the fsh 7 is something suggesting the us that fsh is in a normal range so when it is in normal range it cannot be pituitary failure because what should happen to the fsh level in a pituitary failure it should become low less than 5 right so this is 7 looks normal so it cannot be pituitary failure it can neither be ovarian failure because in ovarian failure, as I told you, it should be more than 20. But here it is again 7 which is normal. So that is one thing which is telling me that it can neither be pituitary nor ovarian. Now coming to the uterine sinicae. Uterine sinicae, it has nothing to do with the FSH levels. So probably we can consider that. What is another point which is directing me towards the uterine sinicae as the answer? History of curettage for abortion. What is uterine sinicae? So uterine sinicae is the adhesions formation inside the uterus. It's the adhesion of the anterior and posterior wall of the uterus. Normally in the endometrium you have the stratum basale layer. And this stratum basale will give, you, give rise to stratum functionalis. Will give rise to stratum functionalis. So you have stratum basale and so you have stratum functionalis is the one which sheds every month and the basale is the one which regenerates this functionalis. But when you are doing excess curettage and doing excess curettage, you no more have regeneration of functionalis layer also. And because of that, what will happen? The anterior and posterior wall of the uterus will adhere to each other. So which we call it as uterine sinicae or the syndrome is also called as Asherman syndrome. It's called as Asherman syndrome. So they present to you with secondary amenorrhea, infertility, right? And usually this is seen due to repeated curettages, overzealous curettages, postpartum curettages, and tuberculosis also one of the reason. On HSG, if you try to observe, you will see honeycomb appearance. Honeycomb appearance. The gold standard for diagnosing this is hysteroscopy. Gold standard for diagnosing this is hysteroscopy. Management is, management of Asherman is hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. Once you see the, through hysteroscope, you see the adhesions, take an adhesiolysis and break those adhesions. So, hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. Right? And post adhesion, you remove all the adhesions, you insert a copper T. Why are you inserting a copper T post removal of all the adhesions? To prevent the re adhesion formation. There is a chance of again the adhesions to form. So, to prevent that, I insert a copper T, okay? Followed by, I will give them estrogen and progesterone for the endometrium to regrow. Estrogen for 21 days, 
and progesterone for last 10 days. So this is regarding the management of the Asherman syndrome. So very important what you have learned from this question is you should know the FSH values and what happens to the FSH when it is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, when it is a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Now this applies even for your uh, male, this applies to your female infertility, this applies to your male infertility, amenorrhea cases. FSH plays a very important role to tell us where are we, where is the problem, okay? So let's see the next question. 40 cc of fetal material was detected on USG. Planned for evacuation, but the catheter goes deep into the uterus without resistance. What should be your next step? So they were doing some cure, they were planning for an evacuation and during the procedure of evacuation, what the suction cannula which they have taken, it has gone deep inside the uterus without resistance. What do you mean by deep inside the uterus without resistance? So it has gone directly inside, it has gone, it has perforated the uterus. So this is a question which they are telling because without resistance, deep inside, nothing but a perforation. And when you have a uterine perforation during the procedure of evacuation, see in pregnancy, the uterus is very soft, right? And here there were retained products for which we have done, we were trying to do the evacuation. And when there is a perforation through this soft uterus, there are two problems. Uterus is soft, fine, so it is more, there are more chances of perforation. Second thing is that uterus is highly vascular. So there will be an increased risk of hemoperitoneum. So as there is increased risk of hemoperitoneum, what should be your further management? You should go for immediate laparoscopy. You should go for immediate laparoscopy. So if patient is hemodynamically unstable, then probably you have to go for laparotomy. You should never do laparoscopy in a patient who is hemodynamically unstable. If they are hemodynamically unstable, we go for laparotomy. But as I have an option of laparoscopy, I'm going with the laparoscopy here. So probably she has not gone into hemodynamical instability, right? So this is a case of uterine perforation. So again, uterine perforation is something which has been uh, given a lot of importance many times. So if you have in a non-gynecological patient, uh, uterine perforation is due to some uterine sound. Uterine sound is used to measure the uterocervical length. That's a very small diameter. So even if you have a perforation with uterine sound, you can wait and watch. But when you have a perforation of the uterus, especially pregnant uterus with a cannula or if you have perforation of non-pregnant non uterus with uterine curette, then please go for immediate laparoscopy or laparotomy depending on the case. Right? So that's again a very important question. So when you have a perforation with uterine sound, you can wait and watch. But if you have a perforation due with Karaman's cannula or with uterine curette, you have to go for immediate laparoscopy. If patient is hemodynamically unstable, you will go for immediate laparotomy, right? Now this question was something very similar to what we got in NEET 2020. So a woman after hysterectomy has shown with distended abdomen, what electrolyte imbalance is seen in her? Now, post-surgery, there are two, two complications which we can see. One is the paralytic ileus. The other one is intestinal obstruction. Paralytic ileus, as the name itself tells, ileus paralyzed. So ileus is paralyzed due to repeated handling of the bowels or probably because of a electrolyte abnormality also you will have paralytic ileus or probably it is because of the hypokalemia you are going to have the paralytic ileus. Now how are you going to differentiate whether it's a paralytic ileus or intestinal obstruction? Intestinal obstruction is due to some adhesion formation post-surgery. Paralytic ileus is immediate Whereas intestinal obstruction takes some days. It's around 5 to 7 days post-surgery. It's 5 to 7 days post-surgery, right? Now, paralytic ileus is because of the 
हाइपोकेलीमिया हाइपोकेलीमिया लीड्स टू एबसेंस ऑफ द पेरालिस सो विच इलेक्ट्रोलाइट इम्बैलेंस इज सीन यू कैन सी द डिस्टेंडेड अपडामिन दिस इज नॉट ओनली प्रेजेंट आफ्टर इस्ट्रेक्टमी आफ्टर सिजेरियन सेक्शन ऑल्सो वी टेन टू सी दिस हाइपोकेलीमिया कॉजिंग पैरालाइटिक आइलियस सो द इलेक्ट्रोलाइट इम्बैलेंस विच कैन लीड टू डिस्टेंडेड अपडामिन इज हाइपोकेलीमिया ओके लेट्स सी सम डिफरेंसेज बिटवीन द इंटेस्टाइनल अब्सट्रक्शन एंड पैरालाइटिक आइलियस now obviously in the name itself it is given paralytic ileus so paralysis of the ileus so obviously what will happen to the bowel sounds bowel sounds will be absent in paralytic ileus but as an intestinal obstruction there's an obstruction below the obstruction bowel sounds are absent but above the obstruction the bowels are trying hard to push all the contents inside so bowel sounds are increased in intestinal obstruction so the other differences which we have are in pa- in intestinal obstruction the pain is intermittent colicky pain with long free intervals paralytic ileus may mild dull aching pain of of distension or no pain paralytic ileus may you have moderate shock simple obstruction may mild shock palpation tenderness especially over the site of obstruction paralytic ileus no to mild tenderness it's a dead silent abdomen hyperperistalsis and then silent abdomen it relieves in hours when you do nasogastric suction for simple obstruction whereas for paralytic ileus it relieves the distension immediate leukocyte count is not increased in both so these are some of the differences right and for paralytic ileus for paralytic ileus the treatment is as you have absent bowel sounds you should keep her npo if you give her anything orally she might go into nausea and vomiting so she can't pass it from below so she'll be pass it from above so you keep a nasogastric suction ng tube you can keep ng tube and relieve the uh, distension mainly you have to put her on iv fluids and which iv fluids will be beneficial for her it is all because of hypokalemia so what iv fluid contains potassium so you can give iv fluids that is rl this is self limiting disease once the potassium levels come back to normal the bowels will start moving and once the bowel sounds so keep her npo is also important nil per oral and once bowel sounds return start on fluids followed by start on so that's about the paralytic ileus okay so a post surgery hyperdistension abdominal distension you should always think in terms of paralytic ileus and the reason for paralytic ileus is hypokalemia next question so this was another image which has come as an image based question there were plenty of images and this was one of the image now if you observe here placenta looks like a single placenta right amniotic sac looks like two one glance and i'm in a hurry i'll answer this as monochorionic diamniotic but please observe more closely if you observe closely between two amniotic sacs you are seeing an intervening membrane this is nothing but the placenta so they have two separate placental layers and two separate amniotic sacs but the why placenta is looking one is it's a fused placenta so as you have an intervening membrane between two amniotic sacs this is dichorionic diamniotic but the only thing is that it has a few but the only thing is that fused placenta right now if you see this is a pretty clear cut clear cut two separate placentas two separate amniotic sacs so dichorionic diamniotic this one is the one which we got in the exam so where the placenta is one and amniotic sacs are two and there is an intervening membrane so this is also a dichorionic diamniotic but fused placenta next you have single placenta please observe this one amniotic sac divided into two pieces but there's no intervening membrane there's no intervening membrane can you observe no intervening membrane but two amniotic sacs and this is the placenta so this one is monochorionic diamniotic 
when you don't have an intervening membrane at all you call it as monochorionic monoamniotic when you don't have the intervening membrane at all you call it as monochorionic monoamniotic so that is regarding how we differentiate right now guys a uh, few more uh, very important points pertaining to twins which is asked always all dizygotic twins are dichorionic diamniotic is it true or false all dizygotic twins are dichorionic diamniotic true or false yes two zygotes so no fighting both have their own separate bedroom and bathrooms okay so all dizygotic are dichorionic and diamniotic but all dichorionic are dizygotic is a wrong statement now monozygotic can also become dichorionic diamniotic depends on at what time it has divided if the division takes place before 72 hours it will give rise to dichorionic diamniotic if the division takes place between 4 to 8 days then it will give rise to mon single placenta and two amniotic sac sharing i think we can tell sharing room but two separate bathrooms right if the division takes place after 8 days so around 8 to 12 days 9 to 12 days then sharing bathroom sharing uh, bedroom monochorionic monoamniotic if the division takes place beyond 12 days that is on 13th day or more then even the bodies will be joined that is called as conjoint twins and this should be on your tongue tips because this has been asked many 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 times okay so this is regarding the placentation and what placent what chorionicity and amniotic develops on depending on the time of division a very important for to differentiate dichorionic diamniotic usually they give us an image based question that is the lambda sign or twin peak sign anyway we are discussing twins let's see the lambda sign and twin peak sign so this scan to observe the lambda sign or t sign is done between 11 to 13 plus 6 weeks and when you are doing the 11 to 13 plus 6 6 weeks scan see this is you are observing the junction so this junction is looking like a lambda so when the lamb it looks like a lambda lambda sign or we also call it as twin peak sign so lambda sign or twin peak sign is seen in dichorionic diamniotic see the junction of the second twins it's a amniotic sac with a chorion so this looks like a t so this is called as t sign and t sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic twins t sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic twins whereas lambda sign or twin peak sign is seen in dichorionic diamniotic t sign is seen in monochorionic diamniotic twins an intervening membrane between in dichorionic diamniotic it will be more than 2 mm as for t sign it will be less than 2 mm so next question a 23 year old with post coital bleeding on post speculum examination the following is seen it bleeds on touch now based on this question i would say that the history wise it looks like a post coital bleed bleeds on touch it looks like a ca cervix framed question but if you see the image based on the image you will confirm that this is not a ca cervix if you see the image you can observe there is a small thing coming out from the cervix the it's like a small thing coming out from the cervix right can you observe here it's like a small thing which is popping out from the cervix right so this small thing popping out from the cervix is not a ca cervix why now in ca cervix you always know there are four cardinal signs and four cardinal symptoms now guys you should know this the four cardinal signs and four cardinal symptoms are first symptoms may post coital bleed irregular vaginal bleeding and next you have pelvic pain and we have the fourth cardinal symptom is 
foul smelling discharge so you all know uh, rice uh, water after boiling the rice the water ganji we say kanji ganji we say so it looks like that and smells like that so foul smelling discharge these are four cardinal symptoms suggestive of ca cervix for foul smelling discharge but post coital bleed is not only seen in ca cervix it can be seen with cervicitis ectropion polyps right so we should be aware that post coital bleed can be seen but post coital bleed is a specific symptom for ca cervix signs may you have the ca cervix looks like a cauliflower like growth so it is a hard indurated cauliflower like growth it bleeds on touch it is fixed and it is friable it is friable see the light cauliflower cauliflower is also fixed but what happens when you try to touch the upper part of the cauliflower the small small tukade it comes out so it is friable so same way ca cervix i'll show you the picture of ca cervix also this is how the ca cervix looks like so and very important one more important point which would have which should strike to you is where does the ca cervix starts to develop ca cervix starts to develop from transformation zone the first site of ca cervix is the transformation zone so it starts to develop from the transformation zone and you will see the cauliflower like growth which is friable bleeds on touch but it is hard and fixed and like this it is arising from the inside the endocervix from in from the cervix and a small dot like this is nothing but a cervical polyp it's very easy to treat it you can take in a small artery forceps hold that and uh, do twisting movements usually it comes out right so this was a cervical polyp i really feel that image was pretty good this is a ca cervix ka image now let's see the next question 22 year old asking for emergency contraception guys even last year uh, contraception say you got two to three questions this time also almost four questions have come from contraception so contraception amenorrhea these are like you know must to read before you go for exam ca cervix you know many times students keep asking important topics these are like must okay so 22 year old asking for an emergency contraception within 8 hours of sexual assault she is on 13th day of cycle more so likely she'll get can get pregnant what is a suitable emergency contraception so you need a emergency contraception which can stop the ovulation or stop the fertilization right now if actually options are not giving much kick because you know options may what i got from the students are these bmpa is not an emergency contraception ocp from day 1 of the next cycle will be a contraceptive effect for next cycle it's not ocp giving from next cycle cannot be considered as an emergency contraception misoprostol is a contragestive it is a abortifacient not an interceptive or an emergency contraception so the best answer you have here is the lng so lng pill taken within 72 hours can help in prevention of ovulation as well as fertilization obviously when it prevents ovulation it's preventing the fertilization also right so the answer here is the lng tablet single dose 1.5 mg so let's quickly go through the emergency contraceptions okay again emergency contraception is a very 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 important many times asked in mcq both in neat fmg every possible exam emergency contraception is also called as emergency contraception is also called as interceptive or you also call it as post coital pill or morning after pill so it is called as emergency contraception interceptive post coital pill or morning after pill right so the most effective 
emergency contraception is copper tea copper tea the most effective emergency contraception is copper tea now many people say is iucd i agree with you iucd means copper tea but please remember lng iucd cannot be used as an emergency contraception this is something which is missed by the students so let it be clear today lng iucd cannot be used for emergency contraception it is the copper tea which is used as an emergency contraception right so most effective is copper tea within 72 hours sorry within 120 hours of the unprotected intercourse second most effective second rank right is for ulipristol acetate ulipristol acetate is a selective progesterone receptor modulator it's a sprm the dose of this for emergency contraception is 30 mg single dose this also can be used within 120 hours of the unprotected intercourse followed by that you have lng the dose of lng pill is 1.5 mg stat dose within 72 hours followed by along with as effective as lng is the mifepristone mifepristone is also called as ru486 last december they asked what is the dose of mifepristone as an emergency contraception so the dose of mifepristone as an emergency contraception is 600 mg according to who it is 10 mg but as such it is uh, 600 mg other uh, other emergency contraception which are not very widely used are uspes regimen uspes regimen includes high dose of estrogen and progesterone pills so two tablets of 50 microgram ethanol estradiol plus 250 micrograms of lng followed by another two tablets this entire regimen should be taken within 72 hours right next you have the saheli what is saheli saheli is nothing but ormelexifene even saheli or ormelexifene or the centrochromin also can be used as an emergency contraception so these are some of the emergency contraceptions which we have uh, so going back most of your emergency contraception act by delaying the ovulation is the inhibition or the delay of the ovulation okay next so second uh, contraceptive question only what is the mode of the insertion of the following contraceptive so you can observe there are small coils which are inserted into fallopian tube so this procedure is called as assure assure it was first designed in france so how do you do this it is hysteroscopic method so through hysteroscope you insert this micro coils on both fallop on both sides of the fallopian tube so it's a it's available in france mainly here you use a micro coil or a spring like device this micro coil or spring like device is made up of nickel and titanium alloy so there it is introduced by using a hysteroscope inserter and once you insert this there will be fibrosis of the fallopian tube but for that fibrosis of the fallopian tube you require 3 months so till 3 months she should use additional contraception and once the fibrosis of the fallopian tube occurs this is a permanent method and you cannot reverse it so this is a permanent method and you cannot reverse it so in 3 months time scar tissue will grow into the device and plug the fallopian tube okay so this is a hysteroscopic tubal ligation called as assure where you are inserting a micro coil into bilateral fallopian tubes so what is the contraindication of the image given so nothing but it's a copper tea right so copper tea or the iucd ka what is the contraindication guys even last exam December two thousand and nineteen. Also, there was a question on contraindications of copper tea. So, the basic funda for the contraindications of copper teas or any IUCDs is, if there is some problem inside the uterus, don't insert a foreign body. That's the basic funda. Okay. So, the mnemonic I have is, please 
डोंट यूज कॉन्ट्रसेप्टिव ओके सो पीस पोस्ट अबॉर्टल सेप्सिस और प्योर पेरल सेप्सिस there is an infection how can you insert a foreign body so post abortal sepsis or puerperal sepsis pregnancy postpartum postpartum 48 hours to 4 weeks is also an absolute contraindication so pregnancy postpartum 48 hours to 4 weeks pure peril sepsis post abortal sepsis active pid so there in all these there is some infection in the uterus as there is some infection in the uterus how can we insert an iucd it will further aggravate it so you should not insert right next tuberculosis active tuberculosis don't be distorted uterus so where do we have the distorted uterus fibroid uterus and uterine anomalies next use undiagnosed vaginal bleeding undiagnosed vaginal bleeding you don't know what is the reason for its bleeding contraceptive is cancers all cancers may which are uh, uh, pertaining to the uterus so cervical cancer gtn gestational trophoblastic neoplasia that's corio carcinoma and uh, for lng iucd extra are breast and ovarian cancer so these are the contraindications where iucd should not be kept so basically wherever you have some problem already inside the uterus don't insert a property that's the basic funda here right so here the best answer you have is pid the best answer you have is pid anemia you can insert unexplained it is unexplained vaginal bleeding you should not insert a woman who is lactating came to the see another question on contraceptive a woman who is lactating came to the opd 6 months after delivery for checkup and to get advice for contraception she still wants to continue breastfeeding her child which is not advisable uh some people tell this is week some tell this is months right so patient has come to you and she still wants to continue to breastfeed can we give pop or minipil pop and minipil are absolutely can be given iucd cannot be inserted from 48 hours to 4 weeks but 4 to 6 week it's a relative contraindication you can insert and beyond 6 weeks you can insert iucd beyond 6 6 weeks whether it was a question of 6 weeks or 6 months beyond 6 weeks you can insert an iucd so iucd can be inserted pop can be given minipil can be given combined ocps are avoided in lactation as it decreases the amount of breast milk combined ocps are avoided during lactation as it decreases the amount of breast milk so the best option here is combined ocp so next question is what is the most common co cause for ca cervix now we are all very much pretty aware that hpv is the biggest villain for ca cervix but there are plenty of hpvs which are associated with ca cervix what is the most common hpv which is associated with ca cervix so let's see some single liners here hpv 6 and 11 are associated with genital warts condyloma acuminata right hpv 16 and 18 are associated with ca cervix and among 16 and 18 also the most common hpv associated with ca cervix is hpv 16 so hpv 16 is most commonly associated with ca cervix hpv 16 mainly causes 
squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. Whereas HPV 18 mainly causes adenocarcinoma of the cervix. HPV 16 is associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, whereas HPV 18 is a specific for adenocarcinoma of the cervix. HPV 31 and 33 are associated with CIN's carcinoma in cervical intraepithelial neoplasias. So these are few points which you should be knowing about the HPV. As I told, CO cervix is always important. You should be knowing everything pertaining to CO cervix in a perfect manner. Right? Now let's go to the next question. A 30-year-old female came for regular checkup with and we found a uniloculated 6 into 6 centimeters ovarian cyst. What is your next step in the management? Now guys, whenever you have an ovarian cyst, the management depends on the age group. Now this was 30 years. So usually when they are reproductive age group, I am not suspecting they will have malignancy. Malignancy can be suspected, that is epithelial ovarian cancers can be suspected beyond 45 years, right? So here ovarian cyst in reproductive age group or less than 45 years. If it is less than 5 centimeters cyst, you can just wait and watch and follow up. OCP is not evidence based but many people give OCPs for 3 cycles. But it's not evidence based. 5 to 7 centimeters, if it is a simple cyst, you can wait and watch and follow up. Simple means benign. So for features of simple cyst are it should be uniloculated, homogeneous, thin septations, right? If you have complex cyst, that is the features of malignant cyst, then you have to go for surgery. And if the size of the ovarian cyst is more than 7 centimeters, then directly go for surgery. Okay. Now, if you go back to the question, here uniloculated and that too, she came for a regular checkup and you found it. So, it's an incidental finding and a uniloculated. Usually, the complex cyst will be multiloculated. So, this uniloculated is suggestive of a simple cyst or a benign cyst. So, as it is a benign cyst and 6 centimeters, that is in range of 5 to 7, I can do wait and watch. So, my best answer will be combined OCP and follow up. CA125, no point. CA125 should be monitored for those patients above 45 years. Laparotomy and ovariotomy or cystectomy is not required as of now because it's a benign cyst and less than 7 centimeters. So, you have to follow this table. This is very important. Now, pertaining to the old age, also, I'll write here. So, if the patient is postmenopausal or age of the patient is more than 45 years, you have to suspect epithelial ovarian cancers. The most common epithelial ovarian cancer is serous cystadenoma or serous cystadenocarcinoma. And the tumor marker for serous cystadenoma or cystadenocarcinoma is CA125. So, any patient postmenopausal or more than 45 years comes to me with an ovarian cyst. I first want to rule out epithelial ovarian cancer. So I will first do CA125. So I'll first do CA125. If CA125 is less than 35 international units per liter, it means it is normal. Then size of the ovarian tumor less than 7 centimeters. Just wait and watch and follow up. USG follow up. If the size of ovarian tumor is more than 7 centimeters, you have to go for surgery. If CA125 is more than 35 international units per liter, irrespective of the size, surgery. Irrespective of size, surgery. Okay. Now that is about the postmenopausal patients. Okay. So ovarian cyst and their management is again a very important MCQ. A patient underwent oral glucose tolerance test at 27 weeks of gestation. Her fasting blood glucose was 130 milligram per deciliter and 2 hours blood glucose is 200 milligram per deciliter. 
Her AFI is 14. What is your next step in the management? Are they normal glucose values or abnormal glucose values? They are abnormal. Now, I don't have a clarity whether it was 75 gram GTT or 100 gram GTT. But when you give 75 gram GTT, when you give 75 grams GTT, right, you have to give it in the fasting state. You measure fasting 1 hour and 2 hour. Normal is fasting should be less than 92 milligram per deciliter. 1 hour should be less than 180. 2 hours should be less than 153. 2 hours should be less than 153. Any one value abnormal, you call it as deranged and you have to go for treat. You have to label them as GDM. In this patient, fasting was 130. High. 2 hours was 200. Very high. Right? So, 100% she is labeled as GDM. You also have 100 grams GTT. 100 grams GTT may you give 100 grams of glucose and you check fasting 1 hour, 2 hours, 3 hours. Fasting should be less than 95. 1 hour should be less than 180. 2 hours should be less than 155. 3 hours should be less than 140. Okay. And here again both were abnormal. So that's why you call it as GDM. Now when you have a GDM, you can first try with medical nutrition therapy. But here I didn't have the option of M MNT. Uh, start insulin and check her at 34 weeks. When, when you have diagnosed it as GDM and uncontrolled sugars, you have to first m decide how much dose of insulin you have to give. So to see whether the insulin dose which you are giving is adjusted to her or not, you admit them. So you have to admit her and start insulin. Admit her and start insulin. And we check the fasting sugars. It's called 7 pint profile. Fasting. Pre-breakfast and post-breakfast. Pre-lunch, post-lunch, pre-dinner, post-dinner. So that way you are checking the uh, four, seven times. Sir. Seven times you are checking. And then, then you have to adjust, then you have to adjust the insulin dose accordingly. Then you have to adjust the insulin dose accordingly. So, uh, like, you know, if you are giving mixed start or regular insulin. So, depending on the pre-breakfast and post-breakfast, whether the dose is, is getting enough or whether it's going high dose, I'll adjust accordingly. And once the dose is adjusted, with that dose, I'll send her home. And I'll call her back with the, uh, with again the sugars, right, to monitor her. So, this is how we treat the GDM when they have uncontrolled sugars, okay. Patient presents at 11 weeks of gestation with mild spotting per vaginum. On USG, there is gestational sac with, without fetal node. Now, 11 weeks, by 11 weeks, per se with the question if you take, by 11 weeks, you should see embryo, proper embryo being formed. Kyuki, by 4 plus 5 weeks, 4 weeks plus 5 days, you will have, on TVS, you will have gestational sac. By 5 weeks, you will have the yolk sac. By 6 weeks, you'll have fetal pole and fetal heart rate. But here, even at 11 weeks also, you're not seeing any fetal pole. Then definitely it means it's a empty sac or a blighted ovum. That's nothing but the missed abortion. So as there is a gestational sac, but no fetus present, so you can consider it as a missed abortion, right? So a proper definition of missed abortion is when mean sac diameter, so when you have a gestational sac, the mean sac diameter, when mean sac diameter is more than 25 mm with no fetal pole or 
when crown rump length is more than 7 mm with no FHR, we call it as missed abortion. We call it as missed abortion. So I repeat, when mean sac diameter is more than 25 mm with no fetal pole or when crown rump length is more than 7 mm with no fetal heart rate, we call it as a missed abortion. So that's a proper definition of missed abortion. So here my diagnosis is missed abortion because you have a sac but you don't have the baby inside. Okay. So next question, I think the mere image itself is more than enough for you to answer. So amenorrhea is again a very important topic guys. So a 14 year old presents with cyclical abdominal pain and has not attained menarche yet. And you have, you see the following image. So what is that image? It's a bulging hymen. It's a bluish bulging hymen which you are seeing here. And the bluish bulging hymen, the picture itself is a self-explanatory that you are dealing with a imperforate hymen. Imperforate hymen, right? This is nothing but the imperforate hymen. So imperforate hymen may, they will not as the men, HPO axis is intact. Hypothalamus is normal, pituitary is normal, ovary is normal, uterus is also normal. Uterus also is responding. HPO and uterine axis is normal. But the darwaja, the final gate is closed. The final gate is closed, right? So it's an outflow tract obstruction. It's also called as a false primary amenorrhea or cryptomenorrhea, right? So because the she is having normal HPO and uterine axis, she will menstruate every month. And this menstrual blood starts getting accumulated in the uterine cavity. It starts getting accumulated in the uterine cavity. So first it starts getting accumulated in the vagina, which we call it as hematocolpus. Then it goes into the uterus hematometra. Then it goes into the tube hematosalphinx. Then it goes into the pelvic peritoneum. When the menstrual blood goes into pelvic peritoneum, it is not hemoperitoneum. It is endometriosis. I know many students tell it as hemoperitoneum. It is not hemoperitoneum. It is endometriosis. And this hematocolpus can press on the urethra of the patient and can lead to retention of urine. It can lead to retention of urine. Okay. So they present to you with primary amenorrhea, cyclical pain abdomen, Sometimes they can also present to you with acute retention of urine. You don't require any much major investigation. So simple local examination you will see. Treatment is making an X-shaped incision. X-shaped or the cruciate incision. Okay. Let's go to the next question. A patient presented with secondary amenorrhea after 5 years of her marriage. See again amenorrhea. What is the take home by till now what you understood? Amenorrhea, contraception, right? Very very important topics. So a patient presented with amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea after 5 years of her marriage. On examination she was found to have retroverted uterus with some tenderness in and swelling near the pouch of all of uh, posterior wall of vagina. What is your appropriate diagnosis? Now, retroverted uterus can be due to a cervical fibroid and posterior wall fibroid and endometriosis. Unlikely to be adenomyosis. Adenomyosis, you have a normal enlarged 12 to 14 week size uterus. Okay. Pouch of Douglas may posterior cervical fibroid can pull the uterus and cause retroverted actually. But it's a there is associated tenderness also in the pouch of Douglas. So three fix three signs, three cardinal signs and cardinal symptoms. Three cardinal signs and three cardinal symptoms of endometriosis are. Three cardinal symptoms are DID, Dance India Dance, right? So that is dysmenorrhea, 
the dysmenorrhea in endometriosis is also called as progressive dysmenorrhea or triple dysmenorrhea because she'll have pain before menstrual cycle during menstrual cycle and after menstrual cycle also so you call it as dysmenorrhea progressive dysmenorrhea or secondary congestive dysmenorrhea that is painful coitus and infertility three cardinal three signs are fixed retroverted uterus so the adhesions in the pouch of douglas pulls the pulls the uterus back so fixed retroverted uterus firm fixed adnexal mass and the third one the third one is so you have firm fixed retroverted uterus firm fixed adnexal mass and the third one is bluish nodules in the pouch of douglas bluish tender nodules in pouch of douglas okay so it is fitting to those two so tenderness and swelling near the posterior wall of vagina can be your uh, this bluish tender nodules in the pouch of douglas and they also have tender uh, uh, ten, uh, retroverted uterus with tenderness so those are suggestive that you are dealing with a endometriosis you are dealing with a endometriosis so you should these are the three fixed signs and three fixed symptoms most consistent symptom with endometriosis is pain is pain that is dysmenorrhea leopold manuvers was asked as an mcq leopold manuvers or leopold grip 2 was asked as an mcq for inct and leopold 3 manuvers was asked as an mcq mcq for you people right so leopold first manuvers is also called as fundal grip fundal grip so what you do here is you try to palpate the fundus of the mother to see what is present if you see if you feel there is a soft broad and irregular structure soft broad irregular it is the buttocks of the baby if you feel there is something hard curved globular hard curved globular and bellotable and bellotable then it is the head if head is present above what will be the presentation it's a breech presentation similarly if buttocks are present above it is a cephalic presentation so indirectly it is telling you about the presentation so the first grip is also called as is also called as first leopold manuvers first leopold manuvers or fundal grip the second leopold manuvers is to see what is present in the lateral aspect of the uterus so these are called lateral 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 grip or umbilical grip you call it as lateral grip or umbilical grip so here you try to palpate what is present laterally if you feel there is a smooth curvilinear resistance then it is the patient's spine if you feel multiple knob like structures then it is the fetal limb then it is the fetal limb multiple knob like structures okay so lateral grip or the umbilical grip will tell you which side is the spine and which side is the limbs so the third leopold manuvers is also called as pollix grip theek hai so the first three leopold manuvers are by seeing the patient's face only the fourth leopold manuvers is by seeing the patient's feet okay third leopold manuvers was asked for you to in the exam 
So you keep thumb on one side, four fingers on other side, and you try to again palpate what is present in the uh, what is present, what is acting as a presenting part. If I feel there is a hard, curved, globular, and bellotable, it's the head. So cephalic presentation. And if it is completely bellotable, it is it is not engaged, right? Kephal is not engaged. And if I feel there is a soft, broad, irregular, not bellotable, then it is the breach. Then it is a breach presentation. So the third Leopold manure or the pelvic pollux grip will help you to confirm the presentation. Confirm the presentation. If the lower pole is empty, then it is a transverse lie. Then it is a transverse lie. The fourth Leopold manure is also called as pelvic grip. Right. In this pelvic grip, and please remember, the first three I am seeing the patient's face. Only the last one I am seeing the feet. So you try to go below the presenting part. If, you are, if your both hands are converging and you are able to go below the presenting part, it means the presenting part is not engaged. If, you, if the hands are converging, presenting part not engaged. If hands are diverging, then presenting part is engaged. Then presenting part is engaged. Leopold manures are very, very, very important uh, for undergraduate to postgraduate and many times asked you should have the imprint of this and how do you do Leopold manuals also is very very important during your uh, practicals right this is again a repeat question and it was an image of NEET 2020 so when you have a bilateral dilated fallopian tubes with distension and appearance of a tobacco pouch or sausage shape this is nothing but the bilateral hydrosalphings bilateral hydrosalphings so it is a bilateral distended tubes which are like a tobacco pouch so it's a bilateral hydrosalphings this i think uh, a beautiful picture and uh, you know one mark uh, around say i think all of you would have got so this is nothing but the snowstorm appearance and where do we see this snowstorm appearance it's in the molar pregnancy, complete mole, right? So this is the snowstorm appearance which is seen in hydrated form mole. Complete mole, only abnormal proliferation of the uh, villi. Partial mole may you will have fetus plus abnormal proliferation of the villi. This looks like a complete mole, completely filled with the snow fluid filled cysts. So snowstorm appearance, perfect. It's a complete mold, right? And uh, investigation of choice might be USG. So in, in molar pregnancy, investigation of choice is USG where you will see the snowstorm appearance. But gold standard is histopathological examination. Follow-up of this patient with molar pregnancy is very, very, very important. Next image. Again, one of the favorite of all students. So this is a peripherally arranged multiple cysts. These are peripherally arranged multiple cysts. It's called pearl of chain appearance. See, this pearl of chain appearance is seen in polycystic ovarian disease, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, ovarian disease, right? Steen Leventhal disease. So you have a criteria for PCOS that's very, very important. According to the Rotterdam's 2003 criteria, according to the Rotterdam's 2003, two out of three should be correct and they are, they should be oligo or an ovulation, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism. And the third one, and the third one is USG finding. So what is the USG finding? So USG findings are more than 12 follicles of 2 to 9 mm in size, peripherally arranged. Or ovarian volume more than 10 ml.
right you also have a recent criteria that is ashray 2018 criteria this is rotterdam's criteria right so you should have more than 12 follicles according to rotterdam which are peripherally a range of 2 to 9 mm in size to call it as pcos now according to the ashray criteria ashray may also the first two are same that is uh, oligo or anovulation clinical or hyperandrogenism the third point on tvs of 2 to 8 megahertz on tvs when you are using tvs of 2 to 8 megahertz if you see you should see more than or equal to 20 follicles peripherally arranged of 2 to 9 mm size so according to the recent ashray what is the cutoff of the number of follicles which should be peripherally arranged it is the 20 follicles earlier it was 12 follicles but now it is the 20 follicles more than 20 follicles which are peripherally arranged of 2 to 9 mm size or ovarian volume more than 10 ml then you call it as patient of pcos so PCOS picture, beautiful picture. I think all of you would have done correct and we go, grabbed the mark, right? Most dependent part in a sitting female. You imagine in yourself itself, hepatorenal pouch, paracolic butter, pouch of Douglas. Pouch of Douglas is something which is in the pelvis compared to your uh, paracolic gutter and hepatorenal. Pouch of Douglas is the most depend dependent part in the sitting female. Now this question I felt you should not go wrong in this question. Now hopefully you have not gone wrong. So patient presence in labor and on per vaginal examination, cervix is 5 centimeters dilated and fully effaced. Which stage of labor she is in? If you don't know the recent guidelines, I'm afraid that you might answer this as a active phase. But according to Williams 25th edition, you have more recently a consensus or committee of American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine 2016 has redefined active labor to begin from 6 centimeters. So active phase starts from 6 centimeters. So 5 centimeters is considered as latent phase. Okay. So, if 0 to 5 centimeters, 0 to 5 centimeters is latent phase, 6 to 10 centimeters is active phase, 0 to 5 centimeters is latent phase, 6 to 10 centimeters is the active phase. That's a very, very, very important. So, here she was 5 centimeters, so it is a latent phase not active phase guys so uh, normally in our uh, colleges and medical uh, you know uh, uh, labor room may four beyond four we tell active but according to the your books that is williams 25th uh, and acog guidelines so active phase starts from six centimeters okay next a 14 year old girl presents with heavy bleeding per vagina for last 10 days what should be done to know the cause other than pregnancy test? Even though she is a case of a probably 14 year old, I still do pregnancy test because pregnancy can present in any manner. A heavy bleeding always in a reproductive age woman rule out pregnancy. So once you have ruled out the pregnancy, a patient with a 14 year probably just attained menarche, what might be the reason of heavy bleeding? The most, cause and re most common reason for AUB in this patient is whenever you have a heavy menstrual bleeding, rule out pregnancy. Heavy menstrual bleeding in those girls who have just attained menarche, it can be due to anovulatory cycles because ovulation takes around 3 months to develop appropriately. So it can be an anovulatory cycle. So but Apart from anovulatory cycle, the second differential diagnosis of heavy bleeding in a patient who has just attained menarche is bleeding and coagulation disorders. So after UPT, the next thing which you have to rule out always when you think 
pertaining to a patient who has just attained menarche having heavy bleeding is coagulation and bleeding disorders so for that you have to do coagulation test so for that you have to do coagulation test okay now in patients who are uh, uh, reproductive age group upt first patients who are post menopausal or premenopausal tvs first to check the endometrial thickness if endometrium is thick you will go for endometrial biopsy right another question which i got was a neonate born to a gdm mother has hypoglycemia what is the reason so normally when you have a gdm mother hyperglycemia in the mother hyperglycemia in mother leads to hyperglycemia in the fetus right this is an in utero story i am telling hyperglycemia in fetus in response to this hyperglycemia in the fetus what will fetus produce fetus keeps on producing insulin to optimize the glucose level so hyperinsulinemia and this hyperinsulinemia and increased igf1 also lead to excess growth in the fetus right which we call it as macrosomia and it can lead to shoulder dystocia right this is what is happening normally uh, and this theory is called as pedersen's hypothesis so whenever there is hyperglycemia in the mother glucose always goes from high to low so the glucose glucose goes from mother to fetus in response to that high glucose the baby starts producing insulin so there is hyperinsulinemia right and that is causing macrosomia which we call it as pedersen's hypothesis but once the baby is born there is no glucose coming from mother to baby so understand this point once the baby is born so neonate neonate me this hyperinsulinemia is still there hyperinsulinemia is still there but there is no continuous glucose supply from the mother to the fetus so that leads to hypoglycemic attacks that's why uh, pediatrician keeps on coming to check the glucose levels of the baby and they tell us to give uh, both maternal feed as well as artificial feeds because these patients have high chance of going into hypoglycemic attacks so once uh, in the neonate there is hyperinsulinemia but there is no glucose from the mother to the fetus so baby will go into hypoglycemia what is the reason for hypoglycemia post delivery in the gdm mother it is because of the hyperinsulinemia in the fetus right so these were some of the questions which we had in the fmg december 2020 recall so all of the questions are something which we discuss in our class and are present in our notes so if you are perfect with your notes given by me i think nobody can stop you from getting a, a good score so be perfect even if you are a third year student or final year student start doing mcqs and start doing uh, start reading obstetrics and gynecology so that by the time you come you come for your fmg mci screening exam you're perfect with the topic of obstetrics and it it remains as a strong subject for you so that you almost score a 30 marks so at the max one or two can go wrong but maximum you can answer it correct right so that benefit you will get when you are perfect with the obstetrics and gynecology so i am dr ramya shri i teach obstetrics and gynecology any queries pertaining to obstetrics and gynecology and any help you want in your preparation you can always feel free to contact me through the uh, messenger or telegram groups so thank you guys all the best keep studying